Textbooks frequently teach that man evolved from ape-like creatures. Hollywood culture is littered with evolution, using the film and TV industry to present these alleged missing links as fact. Museums indoctrinate millions with this idea by their sophisticated displays. But what does the evidence show? In this episode of Origins, we'll walk down evolution's hall of shame and demonstrate the lack of evidence for a missing link. Coming up on today's edition of Origins, Discovering the Truth with Dr. Brad Harab. Hello and welcome to Origins. I'm Ray Heipel. It's an honor to be your host today. During this program, we showcase interesting guests who present evidence from science along with other important facts validating the truth of creation and the accuracy of the Bible. Today's guest, Dr. Brad Harab, holds a degree in biology and a doctorate degree in anatomy and neurobiology from the College of Medicine at the University of Tennessee. Currently, he serves as the executive director of Focus Press and co-editor of Think Magazine. Dr. Harab travels the world speaking on Christian evidences, fortifying the family, and cultural apologetics. Welcome to the program, Brad. Hey, it's great to be here, Ray. We're looking at discovering the truth. That sounds really interesting. What are we going to be talking about? Well, if you stop and think about it, if you send your children off to school, you don't want them being taught a bunch of lies. You want them to know what is the truth. And yet we open up textbooks today and time and time again, what we see is not really education so much as it's indoctrination. This is a, a Prentice Hall textbook it says, we know for example, that humans evolved from common ancestors we share with other living primates such as chimpanzees and apes. In this same textbook, they say like all other forms of life, Humans are products of evolution by natural selection. Now, notice in both of these examples that I, I pulled out of here, they're not presenting this as a theory. They're not saying that this may happen. They're saying this is the way it is. Humans are products. We know, for example. And, and so one of the things that I want us to do today is I want us to basically get rid of the lies and fully expose the truth. Because again, if our children are being told things like you're an animal, you share a common heritage with earthworms, then ultimately there are consequences to this kind of teaching. It was Adolf Hitler who once made the claim. He said, if you tell a big enough lie and tell it frequently enough, it will be believed. Mm. And sadly, that is the case, especially when we're dealing with fossil man so today we're going to dive pretty deeply into what about these fossil men, these eight men, cave men. Ray, I know you, you know of folks who maybe have, have bought into this lie. They think, well, you know, surely all those pictures couldn't be wrong. Then you've got Darwin who in his second book, The Descent of Man, he says, there is no fundamental difference between man and the higher mammals in their mental faculties. Wow. Basically arguing that, you know, there's, there's not really a difference between mankind and dolphins and apes. And, and yet I've never seen an animal take a piece of carbon, shave it down, write out notes for a song or, or write out words for a, a poem, fashion a musical instrument, play those notes or, or read that poem to his spouse, you don't see that. You know, it's hard to believe that he, he could actually believe that. You know, he writes this, this book. Yeah, and, exactly. You know, like you said, you don't see animals writing books or even paragraphs or even a word. Right. Yeah, you put a bunch of typewriters in with monkeys and what do you get? You get a bunch of monkeys that are ultimately going to the bathroom <laughs> on the typewriters. So there, there is a massive difference between what is the truth 
and ultimately what our kids are being taught. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 1 verse 26, God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Verse 27 goes on to say, so God created man in his own image, male and female, he created them. What I want us to do is I want us to walk through what I call, Ray, evolution's hall of shame. This is a, a long hallway, lots of doors on it, and sadly, this is a hallway that our children oftentimes do not see in their textbooks. You know, they, they see images just like the ones that are, are here on the screen. In fact, the guy here in this Time magazine, this is kind of the, the new Lucy, so to speak. Scientific name, Artipithecus Romatus Cadaba. It goes by Artie for short, <laughs> as you can imagine. I, I want to give our viewers a, a question to always ask anytime you see images like these, and that is, okay, Where's all your evidence? You know, if you say that we evolved from some ape-like creature, or maybe even for our kids, they need to learn, hey, this is in my textbook, but where is the evidence? All the evidence for Artipithecus cadaver, basically, you see here on the screen, you could put in a very, very small shoebox and still have lots of room left over. If you look carefully, you'll notice there are some finger bones. Right here, we've got some molars or, or back teeth. You've got the head of a femur. All of these right here through the center, those are all teeth. You've got part of a mandible. You've got some long bones of the arm. You've got a, a toe bone. But Ray, I, I want you to notice on this particular image, it is isolated into to five individual boxes the little white lines that are right here. And the reason why is because those fossils were discovered in five different locations. Now that the author goes on to say, Hale Celeste and his colleagues haven't collected enough bones yet to reconstruct with great precision what Kadaba looked like, but they do know that it was about the size of a modern common chimpanzee, which when standing averaged about four feet tall. So we haven't collected enough bones yet to know what this guy looks like, and yet we're gonna put his picture on the cover of Time Magazine and in a two-page spread, and then we're gonna start including him in museum exhibits, we're gonna put him in textbooks. The, the best part of this whole entire article, they have a picture of the toe bone. Now, keep in mind, one toe bone, and they say, in the caption, this toe bone proves the creature walked on two legs. Now, my doctorate's in anatomy and neurobiology. Let me just make sure you understand, there's a whole lot more than a single bone in your foot, 26 bones in your foot. But they go on to say about this toe bone, not only is it separated in time by several hundred thousand years, it was also found some 10 miles away from the rest of those bones. So Ray, I'm gonna go up to the, the screen here and we're gonna walk through evolution's hall of shame. This next guy, he's my favorite. This is Nebraska man. Nebraska man was actually used as proof in the Scopes monkey trial that evolution is true. In fact, in 1922, this particular picture was published in the Illustrated London News uh, of what Nebraska man looked like. So you see this guy, his wife. Now, remember the question we're always supposed to ask, where's our evidence, right? If this really is truth, if we're using it as proof in a, a, the Scopes Monkey Trial, if we're putting the picture on the cover of the Illustrated London News, surely we've got evidence, right? And yet, here's what we know. All of this was built from a single tooth. Wow. It, it looks like four right here on the screen. That's actually the same tooth taken from four different vantage points. From that one tooth, they came up with this guy and his wife. And yet, here's the best part. Later on, they discovered that one tooth actually belonged to an extinct pig. <laughs> not exa pig. <laughs> not, yeah, not exactly our missing link. Wow. In Romans chapter 1, 
Paul wrote, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. It's interesting to me, you know, we deem ourselves homo sapiens, meaning the wise one, and yet we basically are claiming we came from apes. He goes on to say in that same chapter that they worshiped the creature rather than the creator. And I think we see a lot of that going on in our culture today. Let's look at the next candidate in our hall of shame. This time we got Piltdown Man. For this one, we've got to go all the way back to 1912. In Piltdown, England, they discovered pieces of a skull, part of a jawbone. They put it all together. They presented it to the world and they said, here's your missing ancestor. Here's your missing link. And for 40 years... People bought it. They actually believed that, hey, this this is the missing link. Forty years later, we discovered we'd completely been lied to. Because what they actually did was they took a, a fairly modern human skull. They broke it on purpose. They took the jawbone of an orangutan, filed down the back teeth of that orangutan to make it look more human. They then dipped the whole thing in acid to age it, buried it so that they could come along later on, dig it up, reconstruct it, and present it to the world as our missing ancestor. So this is a deliberately false hoax. Absolutely, 100% lie. And yet, as I, I mentioned in the beginning, we're putting these things in textbooks, in, in museums. I, I don't think we should be teaching our children lies. I, I think they deserve the truth. And if evolution is true, why would they have to resort to this? Exactly, exactly. We've got Orc Man. And here you see this one actually is from Spain. We asked that question, where is your evidence? This time it's a, a single piece of bone right back here on the parietal occipital region of the skull. They made a, a cast of it, and if you look carefully at that cast, you'll notice very, very small brain case right here. That, that caused them problems because they couldn't figure out how do we go from a, a brain case that small to what we have today. In the 1980s, they decided maybe this bone fragment belonged to a child. So in 1980, they basically got out all the, the bells and whistles, the flags. They rewrote the books. They said, we got one of the oldest human fossils in Europe, only to later discover it probably came from the skull cap of a donkey. Again, this, this is not science. This is Hollywood. And yet, this is what we're seeing. The next one, I'm sure you've probably heard of. Yes. Lucy. I remember sitting in a, a biology classroom having a professor tell me that Lucy was the one who tied us back to the apes. Donald Johansson, given credit for discovering Lucy. Ray, if you, if you don't know how she got her, her nickname, the night they made this discovery, they were celebrating in the camp. They were playing a, a vinyl record over and over and over. That record was Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. <laughs> the name stuck. Now, it's been over 30 years ago since they made that discovery. Several years ago, we wrote a book called The Truth About Human Origins. It's about 500-page hardback. If you're having trouble sleeping, it's a great book. <laughs> I'm not going to go through every single one of these, but I, I spent several months of my life doing comparative anatomy. One of the things we discovered very early on was Lucy has locking wrist which tells us she walked on all fours. This was actually made, Maggie Fox said, a chance discovery made by looking at a cast of the bones of Lucy. The most famous fossil of Australopithecus afarensis shows her wrist is stiff, like a chimpanzee's. Uh, another discovery that was made was her rib cage. You know, all humans have a barrel-shaped rib cage. Chimps have conical shaped rib cage, kind of like an ice cream cone. When Lucy was first presented on the scene, they said, hey, she's got a barrel shaped rib cage. She's on her way to becoming a human. 
And then they started sending replicas to museums all over the, the country. I want you to read what Peter Schmidt had to say when they got their Lucy replica. He said, when I started to put the skeleton together, I expected it to look human. Everyone had talked about Lucy being very modern, very human. So I was surprised by what I saw. I noticed the ribs were more round in cross-section, more like what you see in apes. Human ribs are flatter in cross-section. But the shape of the rib cage itself was the biggest surprise of all. The human rib cage is barrel shaped. And I just couldn't get Lucy's ribs to fit this kind of shape. But I could get them to make a conical shaped rib cage like what you see in apes. <laughs> when you look at all the evidence, here's what you realize. Lucy was basically nothing more than an adult male pygmy chimp. Now, you may have noticed I said male. That's because they've done all kinds of CAD drug, computer-aided drafting measurements, all kinds of measurements of her pelvic structure, and they can't figure out how would we squeeze a, an infant through her pelvis. And they realize Lucy really should be called Lucifer, so to speak. <laughs> Several years ago in the, uh, the St. Louis Zoo, they had a, a big Darwin display and they were featuring Lucy in that particular display. This is the, the bones that are often identified with her. Now, interestingly, if I were to ask you, what does the real Lucy bones look like? All eight of these have been published as Lucy. And yet when you really start to look at some of these, you'll notice there are some pretty big differences like in the jawbone structure, you start counting things like the ribs and you realize, wait a second, some of them have five, some of them have seven. Kind of makes you want to think, would the real Lucy please stand up? And yet she can't because she's walking on all fours. At the St. Louis Zoo, they had this display. Notice feet, legs, lots of hair. We don't know that that's the way Lucy was. And so we actually pointed this out to zoo officials and said, hey, this is indoctrination. This isn't education. And I want you to look very carefully at what the zoo officials responded when we pointed out you don't have feet bones. Well, they had no plans to knuckle under. They said we cannot be updating every exhibit based on every new piece of evidence. We look at the overall exhibit and the impression it creates. We think the overall impression this exhibit creates is correct. Wow, that is unbelievable. Brad, I have to stop you right there. We'll be right back after these messages. Stay with us. hope you're enjoying Origins TV. It all started at Cornerstone Television in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. We've been producing new episodes for over 37 years now. We praise God for the success of the program and are excited to introduce you to Origins and to us. If you're interested in watching more episodes of Origins, you can find them on our YouTube page. Simply go to YouTube and search Cornerstone Television Network. Click the like and subscribe buttons, then you'll find the best episodes of Origins in our playlist. You can also visit our website at ctvn.org slash origins. One more way you can stay connected with us is to subscribe to our free monthly Hope Today newsletter, which you can do from our website. And if you have any questions, call us here at Cornerstone Television at 888-665-4483. We'd love to connect with you. Thank you for watching. Hi, welcome back to Origins. We're talking with Dr. Brad Harab, who's been sharing about discovering the truth. You know, Brad, that last slide that we looked at where the goal of the museum was to create an impression, not to present the, the truth. truth. Absolutely, and you know, it's, it's happening in museums, it's happening in textbooks, and, and that's ultimately why I'm here today. I, I want to expose 
the lies and hopefully teach children the truth. We, we can't talk about Evolution's Hall of, of Shame without at least mentioning this guy right here, Neanderthal Man. I'm sure you are very, very familiar with Neanderthal Man. This is National Geographic's cover guy. They, they love putting him on the cover. Um, over and over again, what we see about every nine to 12 months is some new revelation about the Neanderthals. And yet, here's what we know. If you were to actually look at what they consider to be a Neanderthal fossil, not a whole lot of difference between them and us. In fact, on the screen, we've got a, what they call a, a Neanderthal skull in the foreground, a modern skull in the background. Aside from the color difference, fossilization, the only, the major difference you see right up here, that thick brow ridge. And because of that, they would say, well, this is our closest ancestor. And so the story that they commonly paint for students is, you know, millions of years ago, we were basically walking on all fours, some kind of ape-like creature. Our food supply started to run down, so we had to get out of the trees and, and walk across the plains, so we, we evolved, allegedly, this biped gait. And so in the textbooks, commonly what they'll do is they'll place this guy right beside Homo sapiens, and they say this is our, our closest ancestor. The problem with that, and the thing that nobody will bring to the attention of students is, all the way back in 1958, a guy by the name of Dr. A.J. Cave, he actually examined the original Neander Valley fossils. And he proved that this was nothing more than a man who had suffered from advanced stages of arthritis. And Ray, if you stop and think about it, today we have things like rheumatoid arthritis, osteoporosis, rickets, all of these different conditions that actually change bone structure, density, do we know today that those kinds of diseases and conditions exist? Absolutely. In fact, you may know folks that have arthritis. Do we know that they, they change bone structure? Absolutely. Does that make them a missing link? No. In fact, you know, if, if you were to suggest that every person in your congregation who has arthritis is a, a Neanderthal, you probably would not be a popular guy. <laughs> you know, the other thing, Brad, too, is that I, I know a lot of people, and you know, we, you know, we're in Pittsburgh, and we have the Pittsburgh Steelers, and I remember some of those Steelers from the 70s <laughs> with these big <laughs> brows, you know, oh, sticking yeah. out some yeah. of the linemen, and them. I mean, I'm sure if their skulls were put on, their brow would be much more pronounced and bigger than others. And absolutely, you know, my family's uh, partially Italian, and we talk about the Roman nose. I mean, you know, there are features that people have. How do they justify saying, well, that's somehow more ape-like? See, that's, that's the frustration on my end. So I, I've dissected well over five to 600 human cadavers. And in doing that, you see all kinds of variation um, from sizes, thicknesses, densities, all. And then you add to that the spectrum of age so, you know, are we dealing with a seven, eight-year-old child? Are we dealing with a 78-year-old adult? You start to realize, hey, this, this is not a missing link category. What this is really it is simply a variation due to either age, um, disease. In fact, I, I want you to read, a fellow by the name of Jack Cuso examined the Neanderthal fossils a lot more than I did. Wrote a book several years ago called Buried Alive. And in that book, he said this, you must understand this skull really cries out disease. He says, the teeth are badly decayed. The bones of the vault of the skull are extremely thick. He says, there are many features that testify of acromelga or the excessive secretion of growth hormone in adulthood. That is the real Neanderthal man. It's not a missing link. It's simply a, a diseased human being. This particular picture really describes what's going on. If you, you read, this was uh, fairly recently, Discover Magazine says the whole oldest human fossil found outside of Africa 
suggest our species may have left that continent 200,000 years ago. The, the two keys that I want you to, to really hone in on there, this suggests this, or it may have been this. At the end of the day, they don't know. And that's what we're left with. What does the fossil record really show? I'm going to let Jeremy Rifkin tell you. He says, what the record shows is nearly a century of fudging and finagling by scientists attempting to force various fossil morsels and fragments to conform with Darwin's notions, all to no avail. Today, the millions of fossils stand as very visible, ever-present reminders of the paltriness of the arguments and the overall shabbiness of the theory that marches under the banner of evolution. You know, Ray, when you really boil it all down, Charles Darwin knew he didn't have missing links. He knew that was the weakness of his theory. Those missing links are still missing today, as is the entire chain. You know, they take uh, the theory and they, then they try to make the evidence fit. Absolutely. That's what we see over and over again. That's not true science, Brad. Exactly. Well, thank you for being on this show. I hope you'll be back with us. I would love to. And I hope you'll be back with us again. You know, one of the most emphasized arguments against biblical creation and for evolution is the remains of all of those ape-like cavemen, right? But do we have the evidence to affirm these creatures actually existed? The true answer is a resounding no. The real evidence we possess shows there is no reason to believe in any of these creatures and every reason to believe the Bible. It just goes to show you once again that we do know what the Bible says is true and the proof is all around you. If you enjoy Origins, we sure could use your help to keep this creation television program on the air. Your support, both prayerfully and financially, make a big impact. So let's work together to reveal how awesome our Creator truly is. And we'll see you next time right here on Origins. Thank you for watching this edition of Origins. For a DVD of this series, you can order online or send a $12 donation to cover shipping and handling and write to Origins Program Number 2401, Cornerstone Network, Wall, Pennsylvania, 15148. This presentation was made possible by the faithful prayers and financial support of you, our Cornerstone family.